Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Mobile Robot Systems course. This lecture is all about assignment methods, which lie at the core of many multi-agent coordination problems. We'll start with a seminal method, which is the Hungarian algorithm, for which we use discrete, countable representations of multi-robot systems. And I will also talk about a method that relies on a continuous representation of uncountable robot swarms. And besides looking into several centralized methods, we'll also study one fully decentralized method. Without further ado, let's get started. So this lecture is all about assignment methods, and I'll begin the narrative by motivating the topic on hand of examples from nature, as well as some industry applications. In particular, we'll be studying four different ways of executing assignments, starting with a classical algorithm, the Hungarian method, and then looking into different ways and methods that allow this, us to do this for distributed and potentially also decentralized uh, multi-robot uh, and even swarm systems. So I'd like to start with the concept of division of labor, which arguably is bio-inspired and quite prevalent in nature. So the division of labor is simply the separation of tasks in any system so that participants may specialize. Or in other words, it refers to the allocation of tasks to individuals or even organizations according to the skills and or equipment that those individuals or organizations uh, possess. So in nature, however, um, the division of labor is usually favored by high efficiency benefits or a reduction of conflict within the societies. And it has been shown that natural selection actually favors extreme specialization, where some individuals are completely dependent on the help of others. And this um, example here, this panel actually shows you an example of one of these um, societies where we, we actually have extreme specialization as demonstrated by the composition of the society into physical castes. So two different types of, of ants in this case. And so you can see that these different types of ants have specific behavioral repertoires um, that belong and, and that don't overlap essentially, right? So we have these minor ants that have um, 10 times as many different behaviors as the major ants belonging to the same natural group. Um, for example, here, the minor ants tend to spend more time um, doing self-grooming, for example, where, whereas the major ants have specialized um, to guard the nest entrance. We can also look at different types of, of specialization. In this particular case, um, we refer to this kind of specialization as temporal polyethism, where um, specializations adapt and change during the lifetime of the organisms. For example, here we're looking at worker bees, where younger bees tend to spend more time cleaning cells, um, and older bees, for example, tend to spend uh, more time patrolling and defending the nest. So this is another type of, of division of labor that you can observe in natural systems. Now, bioinspiration also gives clues to the utility of uh, certain uh, mechanisms. And so, we've and so we've incorporated this idea of task allocation into many different application domains. And it turns out that assignment mechanisms are what actually fundamentally allow us to coordinate multi-agent or multi-robot systems. And the reason for this is that, the, um, that they answer the fundamental question of which robot goes where and which robot does what, right? And so arguably, this is really the foundation of coordination in systems where you have multiple actors. And this uh, slide here actually shows you numerous examples that illustrate potential applications where you'd have to solve an underlying task allocation um, problem in order to get these robots to do something together um, that is conducive to a higher order goal. Applications will include things such as um, monitoring and surveillance, which, for example, consider the assignment of robots to locations in partitioned space. 
We can also consider the assignment of robots to tasks that, for example, need to be attended through services that robots can provide, given that they're specialized with certain skills or equipment. And it can also include the assignment of robot cars, for example, um, for mobility on demand systems, where robots are sent to pick up uh, persons or goods and are potentially part of a much larger, larger transport ecosystem. So these are just a couple of examples, um, a very classical examples of how you might want to exploit assignment algorithms to solve uh, industrial application uh, domains. And what's really interesting is that assignment algorithms can be used also for um, slightly um, uh, different types of, of problems, such as trajectory generation in larger robot systems. And the reason for this is because they answer the question of who goes where and how am, I, how am I going to do this in an efficient way, right? So if I'm a robot, I need some assignment algorithm to help me understand um, what role I should be playing in this larger system of robots that are trying to maintain formations, potentially under different constraints, right? And the underlying goal here in these multi-robot um, trajectory generation problems is the robots want to optimize speed transitions, for example, um, whilst obviously not colliding with each other, um, nor with any of the obstacles in the environment. So for example, in this formation control um, type of problem, you'd want to consider an assignment objective that minimizes overall travel distance uh, for all the agents in the robot team, um, whilst uh, considering any constraints that are given by the workspace. So to recap, um, the assignment problem answers, or the solutions to the assignment problem answer the question of which robot goes where and which robot does what. Um, however, to use such solutions, we first have to understand how to model our systems uh, so that we can map the solutions to the underlying problem domain. And Basically, there are two key components to assign the problems. So we're considering agents, which are the, the, one, the, the components that are actually providing services, and we have tasks. So what is a task? A task can be discrete. For example, a robot may pick up a parcel X from a location Y, or a task could be continuous. For example, we could require a robot to monitor a building X uh, for a duration of time or to search a given area Y. And the key is assumption that we're going to be making um, in this first instance is that different tasks are independent, right? Because considering our modeling dependency of tasks actually leads to a different type of prob problem formulation, which is known as or, or referred to as scheduling problems. And this is something we're not going to be considering within this uh, lecture. So assignment methods um, are drawn from multiple fields. So there are, there's a lot of active research ongoing and lots of new assignment solutions are being proposed continuously. Um, the most prominent field active in the area of, of assignment algorithm development is operations research, um, closely related to economics. Um, and also within um, industrial um, manufacturing domains, there's scheduling, network flows, and also combinatorial optimization areas, um, more closely related to, to core mathematics, actually. However, one of the, the most classical ways of, of formulating or representing the assignment problem is actually known as bipartite graph matching. And we can do this for, for the simplest systems where we, for example, don't necessarily include ta task dependencies. And we'll be working with this representation quite a bit in this lecture. So task assignment is all about optimizing a global objective where we have multiple agents and a bunch of tasks that we want to solve. And the key to formulating this objective is a notion of what utility is. So the utility for us will be um, that an individual robot or some centralized agent knows the value of executing a certain action. And of course, um, it can depend on the context. So the utility could be a value or it could also be a cost or simply a fitness. And knowing the exact and true utility is key to finding optimal assignments. So clearly, if we only have estimates of utilities, then assignments may actually um, end up being suboptimal. But we'll work with what we have, right? 
So um, one example formulation might be, so in this little example, we're considering that Q is a utility and C is a cost. And so the utility, the overall utility um, is, oh, so, well, actually Q would be quality uh, here uh, and U would be utility. So the overall utility of assigning a robot R to a task T would be given by uh, the quality of, or how well that robot is able to satisfy that um, task. Um, minus the cost of that robot executing that task. And if Q minus C is, is not, um, or if Q mi is not greater than C, then we would simply say that the utility of assigning R to T is zero. So this would be one way of modeling um, a task assignment problem um, and giving it a quantitative um, uh, substrate. Now, assignment is all about optimizing a global objective function. And the key question here is, how are we going to write down that function? What does it look like? So let's start by assuming that we have a variable x sub ij that tells us whether a robot i is assigned to a task j. Okay, so we can assume a value 1 for, for an assignment and a value 0 for when it is not assigned. And um, we can assume that xij is simply an element that stems from uh, an assignment matrix, capital X. And what we want to do is we want to find a best possible assignment matrix X that maximizes some uh, performance. So the key is that in many um, multi-robot systems, clearly we'll have a, a given set of constraints, for example, one robot can only do one given um, task at any given point in time, and maybe one task can only um, afford one robot at any given point in time. Now, this kind of formulation can be represented graphically in a very elegant way, um, as is shown here through this complete uh, graph. So the, the completeness of this graph is telling us nothing other than any robot is basically capable of performing any given task. Now, the question here is, how are we going to solve this assignment problem? And you've probably already um, thought of this. Um, a very naive solution, or, or uh, the, the, the most intuitive thing um, that comes to mind to solving this assignment problem, clearly, would be to check all the possible assignments, to calculate the cost of each and every one, and then to simply select uh, the set of assignments that maximizes our utility function. But the problem with this is that this may be very inefficient since if we have a system with n agents and n tasks, we end up with n factorial different assignments. And clearly this would lead to rather long um, evaluation or computation times in order to solve the problem optimally. So what we're going to do next is we're going to look at a better way of solving this kind of assignment problem. So there is um, a better way of, of doing this, um, and it's known by the name of the Hungarian algorithm or the Hungarian method. So originally this algorithm was published by Kuhn in 1955 based on the earlier works of two Hungarian mathematicians, so Dennis Koenig and Jino um, Agevary, uh, which is uh, the origin of uh, the name of the algorithm. And the, what this paper showed was that it was possible to solve this assignment problem in O of n cubed. Now, um, there are a couple of steps uh, to, to solving the assignment problem following the Hungarian method. And without going to the theory or the proofs of why this algorithm converges to the optimal assignment, I just want to give you an intuition of the mechanism itself. So there are four key steps. And we will walk through an example in the next slide. And this is just to give you a summary of what these individual, individual steps do. So in the first step, um, we are simply going to be subtracting row minima. The second step does the same for columns. The third step covers all zeros that are remaining in rows and columns with minimum number of lines. And if the, this number of lines corresponds to the number of assignments that you're trying to make, then you're done. Otherwise, you can uh, continue with step four, creating additional zeros, and then you reiterate with step three. All right, so let's have a look at an example to see or to convince ourselves that this algorithm actually does, does boil down to producing an optimal assignment. So what we're looking at here at the very top um, left hand of this slide is we have a matrix or a, a, a grid essentially that is, um, assigns costs uh, to agents and tasks. So at step zero, this basically just consists of producing the cost matrix. 
At step one, what we're going to do is we're going to subtract a row minima from all rows. So for example, if we look at the first row, um, 69 is the minimum, we subtract that from all values and hence the, the resulting values that we have there. And we do the same for all the other rows in the matrix. We repeat this procedure for the minima over columns. Um, example again, in, in uh, the first column, the minimum is zero, so we subtract zero from all the values, and this returns us the new column, uh, essentially in this case unchanged at step two for this given matrix. At step three, what we do is then we then cover all the zeros with a minimum number of lines. In this case, this gives us three lines that are covered. Now, we know that three is not enough because we're trying to find an assignment between four agents and four tasks. So we know that we now have to move on to step four um, to see if we can do some more manipulations in order to find a full um, satisfying uh, assignment here. So what we do in step four is we create additional zeros. And the way we do this is by finding the smallest uncovered element. We subtract it from unmarked values and we add it to the doubly marked uh, values. So in this case, um, six is the value that we're going to subtract or add. Um, we subtract it from the yellow values and add it to the red values, which produces the matrix shown to the right of um, that matrix at step four. Now what we do is we check again if we can, um, if we have four lines that are now covered with the minimum number of lines or rows that we can use to cover them. And indeed we find four lines that are now covered. And this now tells us that an optimal assignment exists and that we have found it. So if we then look at the final panel on the right hand side, um, the green values show us the assignments that are going to be um, made, essentially. And of course, these are the values that produce one-to-one -one assignments, right? So that you use only one agent or one task for any given one assignment. Right, so this is uh, just a summary of, of how the Hungarian method would work on a concrete example. Note that most numerical software libraries actually do have a function for the Hungarian um, algorithm and you don't uh, or rarely would need to implement, implement it yourself. Although for those of you curious who, and for those of you who want to develop a, a more deeper understanding of it, I encourage you to do so and I also encourage you to look at um, the proofs and, and for a deeper understanding of why this algorithm actually um, boils down to the optimal assignment and why it actually works in O of n cubed. So next I want to show you uh, or motivate uh, the use of, uh, of the Hungarian algorithm on a given example. So in this particular case we're looking at vehicle to passenger assignments, which are a core part of mobility on demand systems, where we're looking at trying to pick up passengers in, say, given time windows, where we know that there's a set of passengers that are waiting to be picked up, and we know that there's a given set of vehicles that are currently free or available to pick up these, uh, this um, querying set of passengers. Now, how do we solve this with, with an assignment algorithm? Well, we have um, three main components we need to define, so the agents um, are our robot cars, the passengers are at their locations correspond to the tasks that need to be serviced or, or attended to. And the cost function here, well, well, that's the question, what is our cost function going to be? Well, the most reasonable or intuitive cost function I, uh, we can think of here is we want to minimize travel time, right? Because this essentially minimizes the waiting time that the passengers um, go through Whilst they're whilst they're essentially waiting to be picked up, so so that is the cost that we want to minimize. So in other words, we're going to pose a minimization problem, which simply says, I'm trying to find an optimal assignment matrix A star such that the cost, so the right hand side of this equation is minimized. And this is simply telling us for all assignments of cars I to, to passengers J, um, give me the minimum sum of all uh, resulting travel times or waiting times. Right? So in this case, we run the Hungarian algorithm, and if we have um, an, uh, an exact estimate of what these travel times are, and if we know where our, our passengers are located, and if we know where our cars are located, um, then this is a trivial problem, given that we have the algorithm that solves it. Now, there are a couple of caveats to this. So the first uh, major caveat is that finding an exact travel time estimate 
is in many cases not trivial, not only because you might not exactly know where passengers or cars are located, but also because um, traveling along um, traffic-heavy roads is an uncertain process and you don't know how long it really will take you at the end of the day. So these algorithms are often working with estimates. And the consequence of this is that the assignments end up being suboptimal because the estimates are only approximate. Another catch to the system is that, as I mentioned before, we need to know where the cars as well as the passengers are located. And this can lead to privacy concerns. So perhaps the passengers don't necessarily want their locations to be precisely known, especially if they're um, heavy duty users of such services then you might be able to infer some patterns over their over passenger behaviors, and this can lead to privacy breaches or, or, or certain things about passengers' habits becoming known to these centralized um, computational units um, that is undesirable uh, for, the, for the clients of such systems. And finally, because of the noise that we might have in these systems, overall, we, we don't ever really know if we, unless we um, you are using more sophisticated methods, whether or not the assignments are truly optimal or whether we're actually optim operating at a highly suboptimal level. Um, there are actually numerous methods that have been published in the recent um, decade or so, or more recently in the last few years, that deal with um, the various issues that I've addressed. So privacy on the one hand side, and uncertainty of the cost estimates on the other hand side. And I really do welcome you to have a, a peek at those papers, um, for those of you who are interested in what kind of methods we could develop to um, circumvent uh, these two complications or uh, challenges. Right, so let's now summarize the assumptions and requirements of actually using the Hungarian method to solve these kinds of um, centralized assignment um, problems. So we, we know now that the costs and utilities need to be communicated or known to a centralized computational unit because that computational unit will collect them, compose this assignment matrix, and then use that to solve um, the assignment problem. We also know that um, these costs and utilities are deterministic, so there is no noise, they don't vary over time, um, uh, they're constant, and um, we assume that we know them precisely. Right? So that's the underlying assumption to being able to assert that the assignments will be optimal. And also we're saying that we're only making one-to-one -one assignments, so there's one robot per task and there's only one task per robot. Now, there are certain complications that arise um, in real-world systems, so often there is uncertainty around uh, the true utility. Um, there are systems that operate in dynamic environments, which in one, on one hand side changes utility um, uh, or cost functions, and on the other hand side might change something about uh, the state of, of agents or tasks. And also, we, we didn't talk about how we're actually modeling robot or task dependencies, especially in systems where we don't actually have homogeneity across all agents, and we might not have homogeneity across all tasks. So imagine if in the case of mobility on demand, um, we're actually trying to assign certain robot cars to certain passengers where the fit might be different. So maybe, maybe a passenger um, at one location is not one passenger, but a family of passengers. And then you want to think about sending bigger cars to those kinds of tasks and smaller cars to singleton passengers, right? And these kinds of constraints or considerations really complicate the assignment process. So consequences of all of the above, um, as I've touched upon before, are so in, in some cases, this might lead to suboptimality. In other cases, we're looking at algorithms that are no longer solvable through the linear uh, sum assignment method because they become NP-hard and require um, versions of combinatorial matching um, algorithms. Um, and, and in some cases, um, so centralized uh, solutions are just simply not possible either because uh, certain information is not available to centralized computational units or because they're just too computationally complex to be solved by one um, centralized uh, component. So next I'd like to um, describe one particular example of a system that is difficult to solve through, through centralized algorithms. Um, as a motivational example for some of the different solutions I'll be talking about later in this um, lecture. So this, is, this example that I'm um, introducing here is an example where we're no longer interested in one-to-one -one assignments. Instead, we, we are interested in um, 
tasks that require more than one robot to be solved, right? So this example here will really help us highlight the issue of assigning more than one robot to a task. And at the same time, many to one assignments actually make a lot of sense. So you could think of robots or agents that are actually working together to solve a task more efficiently because potentially they're complementary or they're collaborating in a way that they couldn't do if they would be trying to solve a task alone. So essentially what we're doing here is we're creating agent or robot coalitions that together are capable of solving a task. Now, this has um, certain repercussions, one of them being that we now need a new cost model, right? Because the cost of solving a task is no longer the cost of just simply assigning one robot to a task. It's more, how do we actually model the assignment value of a robot coalition to a task, right? And this is actually a really hard problem. And I'll say a few more words about this in the following slide. Just to give you an intuition of how difficult this problem is, if we have a system of two tasks and five robots, um, we know that the, the number of possible coalitions or partitions in the system is, is 15, right? You can, you can probably even work this through by hand. But as we scale the system, the sterling number of the second kind actually tells us what this number is for an arbitrary um, uh, set of, of agents and tasks or agents and coalitions. Uh, tasks and coalitions. So, for example, if we have 10 robots and 5 tasks, the sterling number of the second kind tells us that there are 42,525 different possible partitions. All right, so clearly this is a very large number of possible solutions you'd have to evaluate in order to find out which partition here, or which assignment of coalitions to tasks, is the optimal one. So, what kind of problem is this really? And in order to um, introduce this more formally, I'd like to go through a, a little bit of a, a formal um, um, introduction to this problem. So, so let's try to formalize this with a bit of notation, and then we'll find out what kind of classical problem we're actually referring to. So let's assume that we're trying to form robot coalitions, and ultimately these coalitions belong to let's say a set of, of robots, which we, we're going to be calling our ground set of, of components or elements or, or units, right? And we're, we're going to try to then assign these coalitions to tasks, right? So if E is the ground set of our, all of our robots and X is a family of subsets, then we have two conditions. One is saying that um, our robot subsets must be mutually disjoint, right? Because we want um, distinct coalitions that we're going to be assigning to distinct tasks. And we know that we're going, we want to use all of the robots available to us. So we know that the union of all of these subsets or partitions must be equivalent to the ground set that is available to us. So these conditions um, and the problem together form something that is called the set partitioning problem which is defined as a given a finite set um, E and a family F of acceptable subsets of E and a utility function U that maps these family of, of subsets to a scalar, find a maximum utility family X of elements in F such that this solution X is a partition of E. Okay? So this is the formal definition of the set partitioning problem. And in 1978, um, Gary and Johnson actually showed that solving this problem is strongly NP-hard. So clearly, even if we have centralized computational units, um, as we try to scale these systems, we're going to be running into um, a computational bottleneck. And what I'm going to introduce in the next uh, couple of slides is one potential solution or one potential approach about trying to solve or trying to think about how to solve these kinds of problems. And it's all based on the assumption that we can actually relax the problem, which is here very clearly defined in the discrete domain, to the continuous domain. And I'm going to convince you that continuous domain solutions can also be quite elegant in their own way. So what's the key idea behind this relaxation from the discrete to the continuous domain? Now, the key idea behind this is that instead of saying exactly how many robots need to go where, we're going to be saying what proportion of robots need uh, to go where. So instead of, count, instead of modeling multi-robot systems as countable systems where every single robot counts, 
we're going to be looking at these systems more like swarms, where we're more interested in proportions and uh, a distribution of mass rather than an exact allocation of specific identifiable robots to specific identifiable tasks, right? So let's take a second to think about the consequences of modeling systems uh, in this way. And clearly you'll be thinking right now, well, there are a number of applications uh, and problems where we cannot model systems as uncountable. For example, simply looking at um, warehouse and logistics problems where it is essential that every single item and product is picked up and we know exactly which robot is, is, is doing this. Um, but there are a number of problems, for example, if you look at um, environmental monitoring and surveillance problems, where it's more interesting to have a certain coverage of certain areas with a rough number of robots or capabilities in those areas in order to um, have an estimate or feel confident that you're solving the task uh, to specification. So clearly there is a difference uh, between modeling systems as countable versus uncountable. And... Um, where in the case of uncountable systems, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking more at um, a method called mean field approximation, which is it's clearly an approximation, but it's definitely we're, we're aiming to show or what I'm aiming to show you is that it's definitely good enough for a number of, of real world problems. Right. And these pro approaches are very um, attractive, especially when you're trying to solve um, allocation or distribution problems for very, very large robot numbers where, so, where looking at combinatorial approaches um, can be um, compu not only computationally demanding, but um, unnecessary. So I'd like to illustrate, the, illustrate this uh, problem of, of redistribution with uh, a simple example that's, that's going to be our uh, running case study for the next couple of slides. So what we're looking at here is a problem of continuous um, task assignment, essentially, where you can imagine that these different um, gray areas here are potentially ge geographical sites that we want um, a swarm of robots to, to monitor for us. So we want them to reach those sites and perhaps circle around them or just be there and, and be present at those sites to, to um, per per perhaps collect information or, or just simply um, execute certain services in those areas, okay? So what's interesting about this geographical monitoring problem is that we don't really care about the exact number of robots that is every, at, at present at every given um, task location, but we kind of want to have an, an estimate or, or knowledge about the average number of robots of any different kind, for example, in this heterogeneous system that is present at each different site. So let me just say a few words about um, the mechanism behind this mean field approach. So we will be assuming, right, that we care about distribution of robots over these tasks. And the mechanism by which the individual robots will be functioning is essentially to say, well, the robots will be switching between uh, different tasks according to certain transition rates, right? And here, since we're looking at a heterogeneous um, system, we'll assume that every robot type in the system has its own average uh, switching frequency. And the reason why we're actually considering um, switching frequencies and transitioning rates is because we're modeling these systems in the continuous domain as essentially um, dynamical systems, given that we're using this mean field approach, right? So we're looking at the whole system, this, this whole swarm of robots as a dynamical system, and we're aiming to have at steady state of this dynamical system, we're aiming to have a stable distribution of the robots across these tasks, such that this distribution corresponds to the desired distribution that we specified to the system at the outset, okay? So that's a bit of a, a lowdown on, on the specification or the, the, the modeling of, of how we're, we're going to be attacking this problem. So a few more words about this, uh, the way we're representing our problem. So we're actually using a very important abstraction here, which is that we have an underlying graph structure, which is representing the topology of our, our system of tasks, essentially, right? And we're assuming that robots are allowed or enable to move along the edges of this graph, right? So this, these could be potentially roads connecting different sites. And the nodes in this graph are the sites or the tasks, uh, the sites to be monitored, or simply the tasks that are, are to be solved, right? 
Now, note that this problem formulation um, could also easily be viewed much more broadly, for example, as a collection of tasks uh, represented by the nodes of a connected graph, where robots can switch from one task uh, to another at a given rate. And the edges then simply represent from which to which tasks our robots can transition. So I did mention that we're considering a heterogeneous um, multi-robot system in this case. It's not essential to, to the mean field approach, but it does give some richness to the problem um, formulation in the sense that we can actually now at the different, um, so at the various tasks in the system, we can actually say, well, I need a certain amount of capabilities to be present at these different task locations. And um, this is actually an interesting way to think about, you know, heterogeneity, because we can think about robots as, for example, as carriers of capabilities, you know, think of a robot carrying a certain amount of sensing capabilities, or actually a quantifiable number of sensors, or perhaps a quantifiable, quantifiable number of actuators. And perhaps we know how much of a given capability we need to have present at any given um, task in the system, right? So, so let's assume we have this heterogeneous system and that we know roughly how much of any given capability we need to have um, present at any given site or task location in order for us to adequately be able to solve the overlying um, uh, problem that we're looking at here, right? So now the question is, um, how do we model this overall system? So we're going to start by thinking of this whole system as a dynamical system. And as I did mention before, we're, we're going to be taking a mean field approach um, that in this case is modeling the swarm of robots as a linear dynamical system. So we start by saying we have a state of our system, right, where X is essentially um, the distribution of a, of a given robot species over our tasks in the system, right? So here we have a collection of six tasks. And at the, the example that I'm giving you um, in this vector here is telling us um, that in the first task, we have 0.3 um, or 30% of our robots present, right? And we have five tasks, not six tasks, right? So out of the five tasks, 30% of the robots are present at the first task in the system. And um, so x is x sub i is, is just basically the proportion of robots at um, task i. Now um, we're doing this because we're relaxing the problem specific uh, the problem formulation to the continuous domain, and then we go about saying, well, we now need a dynamical equation, and deriving this dynamical equation is relatively straightforward because we now know x is the state of our distribution. Then we all all that is remaining to be uh, specified is x dot, which is the change in this robot species distribution over the tasks in the system. And how does this distribution change? Well, we simply pre-multiply it with a transition rate matrix that is of size m by m, where m is the number of tasks in our system. And there's, so there are certain properties that we have on, on K that, may, that allow our system or that guarantee that our system is stable. For example, the rows or columns might need to sum to one, et cetera, to make sure that uh, we don't, um, uh, so that we, the transitioning between tasks will eventually converge to a steady state. Um, so, and, and this matrix K, well, what does it describe for us? Well, an entry IJ in this matrix K simply tells us how a robot species S transitions from a task I to a task J. So how can we now use this dynamical systems model to solve a given distribution problem? So first, what we need to do is to define a desired distribution of robots over tasks, which we're going to call X star, right? So this is the desired distribution we want to have at steady state of the system. And the problem then consists of solving an optimal um, control problem to find the best possible transition rates, k star, that, for example, are fastest to satisfy x star. So what does fastest mean in this case? Well, obviously, here you are free to define your own optimization objective, but one very, um, uh, I, I'd say, legitimate obje optimization objective is to say, well, we have a, a given distribution of the robots over the tasks at the beginning, and we want to find the transition rates, um, K star, that lead to the fastest possible redistribution of these robots from an initial state to the desired state, right? So this would be one 
um, legitimate optimization objective um, that would allow us to formulate this optimization problem and solve uh, or back out K star. Okay? So again, we have this, our, our, our differential equation that tells us how our robot distribution changes over time. And we know from literature and um, uh, basic fundamental um, theory on, on differential systems, how to solve this kind of um, ODE. And so the solution for this ODE is given to us by the second equation um, on this slide, which basically uh, tells us that we, take, we have to take the matrix exponential times t and multiply that by the initial distribution of robots. And that will tell us how a, a distribution what, or what the state is of the distribution of robots of a given species S is for a specific time t, right? So in other words, given that we have a transition matrix K and an initial distribution X sub zero, we know how to derive the state of, of the, or the distribution of a given robot species at any given time t, okay? Now, finding K star is our optimal control problem, and, and how would we go about solving that? So state of the art has actually considered um, a number of approaches. Um, one of them is by saying, well, we can approximate K and we can then formulate a convex optimization problem and solve it with semi-definite programming methods. Or other approaches might consider stochastic optimization, which are equally feasible um, and applicable to this kind of problem specification. Okay. Now, assuming that we have solved this optimization problem and we now have an optimal transition matrix K star, what do we do with that matrix K star? And how do we use it to tell the robots what they have to do once they're on site? So the idea here is that we're now going to perform controller synthesis from this transition rate matrix. So what does that mean? Well, we know that for a given robot species S, we have this value Kij that would tell the robot how it's supposed to be transitioning um, from a task site I to a task site K. And this transitioning rate is no other than basically describing a transitioning probability. And so all we have to do is take these values and actually use them as, um, or as use them as probabilities that a robot will at any given point in time actually execute this transition, right? So it's like using these values to estimate the probability of rolling a dice that tells you whether or not you're going to transition. And so we use those values to calibrate the a probabilistic behavior of robots um, as they reach sites and as they make decisions on whether or not to move to a ne next site within the graph topology. So as I just described, deriving probabilistic controllers um, is immediate from our transition rate matrix. But how about if we want deterministic controllers? Well, we can also back those out from these transition rate matrices because we know how to compute the steady state distribution of the robots over these sites. And if we know the steady state distribution, we can just tell the robots, well, this is where you're going to end up and we're just going to have you transition from this to that site until you reach your steady state um, uh, site, essentially. So this is a way of actually backing out a deterministic controller. And just a final note here, we can use this kind of our, um, uh, mechanism in both open loop as well as closed loop um, uh, control paradigm. So if we have feedback of how the robots are transitioning, we can close the loop. If we don't have that feedback, we're just going to be using our transition rate matrix K um, blindly, so an open loop um, uh, control. So next, I actually want to show you a video that illustrates um, such a system because I appreciate everything has been very abstract um, till now. And admittedly, the video is still a little bit, this movie here is still quite a, quite a bit abstract, but I just want to walk through it or talk you through what we're actually viewing here before I actually go about playing the movie. So imagine that we have these six tasks um, uh, here in, in this given system of tasks. And what these white wireframes are showing me is the amount of capabilities that I want to have present at any one given task sites. Okay? And I have um, these four robot species that are carrying, um, each robot species carries um, one of these capabilities. So the capabilities are color coded. And so are the robot species. Um, and we'll, we'll see how the robots, as a function of what capabilities they're carrying, 
and what final distribution over, cap over the sites of these capabilities we are aiming to achieve, the robots will be finding, will be optimizing for these transitioning rates so that at the steady state of the system, we will be satisfying the amount of capabilities that need to be present over these um, sites. Right? And so what you'll ha see happening at the beginning of this movie is that the robots first swarm into their initial distribution, which is over the three sites on the right-hand side, where we're essentially saying we don't need any robot capabilities, right? Because the wireframes are all down to zero. And then I'm applying my optimal transition rate matrix, which was computed uh, beforehand, so that these robots then redistribute as quickly as possible into the three remaining sites that require their attention. So now you see them swarming into their initial distribution and redistributing in order to satisfy the capabilities that are required by these white wireframes. And as you'll see, as the system approaches its steady state, the average distribution of the capabilities will be such that these white wireframes are filled out with the right amount of capabilities. And I can use this exact same type of um, system on a real robot system. So no longer a simulation, but an actual physical experiment. So what you're seeing here is an admittedly a much smaller multi-robot system of, of just uh, five robots. But again, we have this problem that we want to redistribute the robots and we don't really care about potentially the exact number of robots. Um, but rather, we just want to use a, a probabilistic control law so that ultimately our steady state system here um, will co uh, correspond to the desired um, distribution of robots over sites. So we have two boat types here in the system. We have species one, which is a, a little boat, and we have species two, which is a big boat. And they start off in this initial distribution. And what we want is we want the big boat to be um, in the upper left-hand corner, and we want um, smaller boats to be in the upper right-hand side corner. And as I play this movie, um, You'll see how the, the boats here are, you are executing this probabilistic transitioning law in order to go from one site to another. And you'll see that the steady state distribution corresponds exactly to the one that I specified at the outset. So at this point, we've seen uh, two different methods for solving the assignment problem. One that works well in countable systems and one that takes an approximative approach and is well suited to swarms of robots or uncountable systems. Now I wanna talk briefly about a third method, which is referred to as market-based um, coordination methods, which is quite popular um, due to its flexibility in accommodating various underlying scheme, assignment schemes um, through its overarching architecture. So here we model robots or agents as self-interested agents that operate in a virtual economy. And the tasks are essentially commodities of measurable worth that can be traded amongst the agents. So an example scenario could be we have um, three robots exploring Mars and the robots need to somehow uh, gather data around these sites or craters and uh, they, they need to somehow distribute over these uh, different sites here. So we have three robots and seven sites and the problem consists of defining or finding out which of the robots is going to visit which site. So market-based coordination um, functions on the idea that we're using auctions to decide which agents will, will get to do which tasks. And as I kind of already intuited, the underlying mechanism are auctions. So the auctioneer is basically, or the idea of, of using auctions is that we can offer items um, where the items are the tasks or commodities or resources in an announcement to the robots and the robots then make bids and negotiate um, which robots will get to do which uh, tasks essentially. There are different ways of winning bids or winning the auctions. So there, there are sealed bids versus open cry. So robots can know about other robots' bids or they can, or this can be private. 
Um, and as an example for, for the actual auctioning mechanism, so I just list two here, it could be the first price, so the best bid, or it could be Vickery, uh, which essentially uh, where the sales price is the value of, of the second highest bids. And other types of bidding mechanisms could also be considered here, which is uh, arguably one of the interesting things about using such market-based coordination schemes, that you have a lot of flexibility in, in underlying, in choosing the underlying components. Um, then we can be considering single item auctions where highest bidders uh, win given tasks and if no bid um, beats the reserve price then the auctioneer um, can retain an item. There can be a combinatorial auctions where we actually have multiple items and the robots um, bid on bundles of items or bundles of tasks. And in this case a bid essentially expresses synergies between items so maybe a robot um, sees that two tasks are close to each other and hence it wants to bid for both in one, in one bid. Um, and there are multi-item auctions where a robot can win at most um, uh, one item apiece, but there's a special case of combinatorial auctions for bundle sizes of uh, bundles of size one. So let's have a look at a specific example here. So this illustration here shows an example of a multi-item auction where robots are making bids which correspond to their costs of servicing each task in the system. So a robot, like say robot one here, um, would it would cost robot 150 to do task A and 100 to do task B, um, and it would cost robot 230 to do task A and 70 to do task B. And for each of these tasks, the reward is fixed, so it's 120 for task A and 150 for task B. And then an auctioneer might say, well, we, we have a, a reserve price for task A, and, and that would not be met if robot 2 um, executes task A, so there's an un invalid bid there. Um, and then based on the other costs and bids, it, the auctioneer might, um, might compose this matrix here and decide, well, it's going to assign robot 1 to task A and robot 2 to task B because that's how it's going to be maximizing its, its profit here, which is essentially, essentially just a combination of bids and costs, uh, bids and rewards. So a vanilla implementation of actually solving this assignment problem would be, for example, to consider a greedy algorithm. So if multiple robots are bidding for tasks, you can simply choose the best bidder and then rerun the auction for each item. Or you could also consider an optimal version, which is essentially using a Hungarian algorithm as the underlying algorithm. And in this case, what you need to do is you need to batch all the data and create a centralized synchronous scenario so that you can compute over the full um, um, uh, cost to task uh, or agent to task cost matrix. Right? So, so this is one of the benefits of using the market-based um, coordination schemes, that you have a lot of, of choices or flexibility in how you want to actually implement the underlying mechanism. And note that there are differences in, in the choices that you make. So obviously greedy is computationally more efficient um, than using optimal, but has uh, but is an approximative or, or heuristic method in the sense that it would not lead to optimal assignments necessarily. Um, and also what I want to note here is that given this flexibility of such market-based coordination schemes, you can implement them in decentralized as well as centralized um, manners. I have listed a couple of examples here of specific implementations. And for those of you who are interested in this area, I do invite you to have a look um, at these various research papers. Um, so so there, there are different, I'm not going to go into the details here, but there were different implementations or instantiations of market-based allocation um, mechanisms that showed um, in each of these respective papers that showed uh, different properties and actually also implemented them on, on either simulated or real robot systems, showing them, showing how they can be used, um, these mechanisms can be used to solve um, the assignment problem. So, so far, all assignment mechanisms we've studied have had a centralized component. So just to summarize the Hungarian method, we saw how it, we need a centralized computational unit that assembles all costs centrally and in a synchronous manner. In our um, continuous relaxation in the swarms method, we also saw how we rely on knowledge of the swarm's initial distribution. So that was X sub zero. So that was a global variable of interest that we needed to have specified. Okay, so this is also centralized knowledge. And in the market-based uh, assignment method, we saw how we require a auctioneer 
that collects all the bids and then makes the assignments. So all of these three methods that we saw thus far, in some way or another, made use of a centralized component. So now the question is, is there also a way of solving the assignment problem without relying on a central uh, component to compute any part of the system at all? And the answer is there is a way of doing this. And I want to walk through one very specific example of such a mechanism that would allow us to do this in a decentralized manner. So threshold-based assignment methods are one potential way of implementing the assignment uh, method or the assignment solutions to the assignment problem in a fully decentralized way. And arguably, it's not trivial to come up with fully decentralized mechanisms for the simple reason that robot systems as a whole need to gather information about what tasks have already been attended to and which haven't. Okay, so this is global knowledge. Now the question is how can we provide the systems with uh, decentralized capabilities to get this knowledge so that the robots can act upon it, again, in a fully local and decentralized manner. So how does the threshold-based assignment me method work? So in this mechanism, each robot is assumed to have an activation threshold for which um, each task, uh, which is which essentially tells the robot whether or not it's going to be uh, performing or needs to perform a task. So if, it, if its activation threshold is not satisfied, it won't be executing any tasks. Okay. Um, the robots will all also rely on this idea of a stimulus that reflects the urgency of a task. And this is something that is continuously perceived by robots in the system. So let's consider this um, example here, which used threshold-based control for an aggregation problem. So the aggregation problem in, that is described in this paper that I reference here consists of a system of multiple robots that need to that are going to use their grippers to go and collect sticks and line the sticks up in a cluster. So these robots somehow need to coordinate to go grab the sticks and put them together in a cluster. The location of the cluster is not predefined, um, but what, what needs to happen here is it needs to happen quickly, and hence the robots are going to work together in order to solve uh, this, this problem in a coordinated manner. So how can we implement a local decision-making scheme that allows the robots to do this without relying on centralized coordination? So the stimulus in this case here is represented by the time needed to find a stick to manipulate. Right? So the longer the time, the lower the stimulus associated with the task of finding sticks and placing them in clusters. And what's important to note here is that the threshold for a robot to decide whether or not to engage with the stick clustering task is totally local. So it's totally decentralized, which means that this threshold has to be self-calibrated. Okay? So how do, we, how, do we de how do we decide on, how do we come up with a heuristic that calibrates the threshold? So the first insight that we make, or the first assumption that we're going to make, is that the number of manipulation sites, right, so the number of sticks, um, or the, the either, either end of the line of sticks, decreases as the global task nears completion, right? So the robots are looking for sticks, and as more and more sticks are lined up in a line, the robots aren't going to be seeing very many sticks or sites where they can actually grab sticks, right? Because as they're lined up in a line, this whole line only corresponds to two grabbable sticks, right? Whereas with, an, with the initial distribution of sticks, many sticks are grabbable by the robot's manipulators, okay? So this is what what this, um, what the, what the stimulus essentially is going to be relying on. Now, the next point is that um, if the time to find the next stick be, um, goes beyond a certain threshold t, um, the agent is simply going to switch to resting behavior. Okay, so this is what we want to obtain through this heuristic that we're going to devise that ca self calibrates the threshold. Okay, now the insight for getting this equation is that. T sub k, right, and if we look at this equation, which is the time to find the kth stick, will start going up disproportionately um, as the task nears completion. And hence, the stimulus will fall below the threshold, and hence, the robots will start to become idle, right? They will start resting. Okay? So this is how the robot will be self-calibrating its threshold, right? By 
estimating or by realizing how long it's taking the robot to find um, the next given stick. So if we look at, and by using the self-calibrated threshold equation, by looking at these two panels here on the right-hand side, we can see how this system actually does converge to a steady state at the end, where essentially um, the average cluster size reaches its full cluster size, and the average number of active workers um, is, is approaching zero. So the, the workers are essentially realizing that there's nothing left to do, and they will start remaining idle. Okay. So this is just to show you that we can use a fully self-calibrated local decision mechanism to achieve coordinated labor, which is, are, arguably requires um, the assignment of robots to sticks in a completely decentralized manner. So I'd like to conclude by showing you an overview of the various assignment algorithms that we've seen in this lecture thus far. Um, so the first algorithm we looked at was the Hungarian method which is a centralized mechanism because it relies on full knowledge of the costs of assigning agents to tasks. It's optimal and the completeness of the algorithm is guaranteed. We've also looked at mean field approaches that are generally centralized, but one could of course imagine that if we have an estimate of the, the initial distribution of robots that can be obtained in a decentralized manner, we could, we could imagine the system also being somehow developed in a decentralized manner. It's approximative, <clears throat> and completeness is only guaranteed in the approximative sense, so when the system converges with very high probability, we are approaching towards the, the distribution of proportion of, of robots um, over tasks that we desired at the outset. With market-based approaches, well, cost estimates can be local, but auctioneers are generally centralized. Um, but estimates don't have to be batched, or bids don't necessarily need to be batched, so we can think of these doing these things um, in highly decentralized manners. There are different ways of executing the auctions, which can be um, which can produce either suboptimal or also optimal um, assignment results. And the completeness really depends on the task uh, reserve prices. So whether or not um, the reserve prices lie below or above below or above what robots are currently bidding or offering. And finally, um, our single fully decentralized approach um, was the threshold-based approach that I described uh, previously. Um, it's clearly suboptimal. We don't have any guarantees on this, and we also don't know whether or not these systems uh, reach completeness. But the great advantage of the system is that we require absolutely no centralized computational units and can be executed based only on robots or agents' local sensing and actuation capabilities. So with this, I'd like to conclude with a, a few pointers to further reading. So there are a couple of seminal papers um, specifically on market-based um, uh, and ta threshold-based task allocation algorithms. I also highly recommend the first paper in this list of bullets uh, bullet points here, the formal analysis and taxonomy of task allocation um, uh, algorithms for multi-robot systems. It's a really good overview of all the various problems you might encounter and what, what formal problem instances these map to and why certain algorithms are better suited than others. So it's a really interesting paper for its overview that it provides. And then I also listed a couple of more recent approaches that tackle a couple of the challenges that I highlighted at the various stages um, throughout this lecture. So with this, I'd like to conclude this lecture and I, as always, look forward to speaking to you in the next one.